Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for being on time. And uh, clearly, the logistics is that we are already running seven minutes late, but I think we'll keep to our schedule because the, uh, we'll just be very carefully watching the time. So, welcome. My name is Veronica McKillop. I chair the UK IPv6 Council, but I'm not doing everything on my own. And I would like to, the people from the core team to stand up so you actually see who is helping with all of this because we never really mentioned them. So, Tim. Chown is here, he's my co-chair, but there is Rich, Tom, and Nick. We are missing someone else. Ian, where is Ian? There is Ian. And David. So these are the guys who are with me on the core team of the council, and they help to organize everything. We are missing three more people. So that's Nick Heatley from BT, uh, Graham from Southampton University, and one more person. Um, that's very embarrassing. I, Ola, yeah, from uh, Ola, uh, from um, Virgin Media. So there is a group of people which prepare the day for you. I hope you will enjoy it. And uh, just be aware, we are recording all these presentations. And the reason why you have seen it on the registration page, why you see it here, is that we actually can release the video recordings because uh, uh, Facebook Meta, they are very concerned about privacy. You understand why. So that's why we'll be probably reminding you throughout the day that everything is being recorded, OK? So you then other people can go and watch the videos. You also had the password for MetaGuest Wi-Fi, which is awesome. One word, lower uh, lowercase a, and the first e is repla uh, replaced with three. There's an exclamation mark at the end. So you can see it here, but hopefully the word awesome is uh, clear to everybody. OK, let's get on with our agenda. Um, um, yeah, OK. So this is kind of, I will do a quick opening and review what's happening uh, with IPv6 globally, uh, what the council is doing, just a really brief talk. But then uh, we really get to the, uh, the essence of this meeting, where Tim is going to be talking about the situation with higher education and their adoption of IPv6. Then we've got here Jean Charles from France, who is going to talk about IPv6 task force in France. Uh, it's great because uh, the task force started only a few years ago. However, France is very advanced when it comes to IPv6 adoption. Plus, the task force is doing some really interesting things, which I believe you will find useful to hear about. Uh, we will then conclude the morning with our awards ceremony, because finally, after a few years, when we really didn't have any companies eligible for the Jim Bound Award, we now have eight uh, awardees. So it's marvelous that we can actually give them the award after three years, we can actually give the awards in person and just reflect on the fact that we are here in person for after three years. In the afternoon, we'll be talking about uh, the first block is going to be a little bit more ISP focused when Andre from RIPE is going to talk about their perspective of IPv6 evolution over the last 10 years in the RIPE region. We will have updates from UFiber and PRSK, which are two ISPs that are being recognized uh, by the Jim Mao Award. And uh, finally, we will talk about a topic which is a little bit uh, contentious when we are at an IPv6 event. But honestly, you can't avoid talking about CGNA if you are uh, in this day and age, even if you are deploying IPv6. So we will have a panel. And after the afternoon break, we will have a remote talk from Alexandra from AWS, who is a senior solutions architect. And you will hear how AWS, who is a significant player in the cloud market, is pushing IPv6 only with their customers. And she, she will talk about why is that so important for them. Um, then we will have Pete here from Mythic Beasts. Some of you who were here three years ago, you remember his talk about how Mythic Beasts, uh, which is a UK-based hosting provider, is doing IPv6 only. And he will give us the part two of this talk, because many things have changed over the last three years. Uh, we'll have David from uh, part of the physics department talking about how uh, the research lab and other research institutions in the UK are connecting to a uh, large hadron collider in CERN, and uh, they are doing so on IPv6 only. And finally, it's been 10 years since the world IPv6 launch. You might remember, for the ones who are very young in this room, they probably never heard of it. But 10 years ago, there was a very significant event in the industry where we can say, actually, that's when we really started to deploy IPv6 globally. And we'll have a panel that will kind of uh, just ponder and, and discuss about what, how things have changed and where things are going. 
So um, I need to remind, I was reminded that I need to tell everybody we are a very social group of people. We like to go for a drink afterwards. So even though we've got breaks here, you all got really busy talking already. So you know the breaks are not going to be long enough for all these interesting conversations. So after the meeting, we are going to Wheatheath, which is just uh, you walk out of the Rathbone Square and onto Rathbone Place. There is a, there is a pub where we go for a few drinks afterwards. And uh, everybody is, of course, welcome. So if you are not rushing off to catch a train or plane, please join us. And then now I need to do something which is called a catchbox demo, OK? So if you guys have questions, and I let the speakers to manage them themselves if they want to take questions during the talk or at the end of the talk, they've got allocated time. But uh, I was told that this I need to throw in order for the mic to work. So Jean-Charles, was it ready? Yeah. To, oh, yes, got activated. Uh, I think it's still manual. <laughs> to Is it working? Yes, it seems. No? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, Thanks. people can hear. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Charles. Okay, there we go. So, that's the, that's the traveling microphone. And I have to say thank you very much to Meta, because thanks to them, we actually are meeting in person. Uh, you know, UK IPv6 Council is a technology user group, we are not legal entity, we have zero income, we don't charge for our events. That means we are in a position where we uh, need somebody else to provide us with a venue where people can actually gather. And uh, this year, Facebook, Meta, they were really kind to uh, offer us this space and we are super grateful for that. Right, so that was the admin stuff. Remember, the presentations are all being recorded, so we can release the videos. And now let's go and have a look at a uh, quick update, what is happening with IPv6, because it's always, every year is good to look at the statistics. Not everybody watches the statistics like I do, you know, I look at it like every month, what's happening. And, um, well, that's uh, where we are with the UK. So I would like to point out that right now, these are actually measurements from, from the last weekend, so the previous weekend, not the last one, uh, because we need to send the presentations in uh, early. Uh, but you can see we are well over 33%, and actually this time we also can see that the other statistics, so this is from Google, but uh, those have been to our, to our meetings, you know, that we look at the different uh, organizations that measure IPv6 adoption. So APNIC, they are doing so by inserting uh, an ad uh, into browser when you're online, and uh, basically whether the app connects or not on IPv6, that tells them whether the host has v6 connectivity. Um, then uh, you can see Facebook and Akamai. The numbers are slightly different because, for example, on Facebook they measure more probably from the mobile devices and how they connect uh, uh, to th with the app. But in general, you can see there is an upward trend. I think I've got here a note that, uh, just to remember that a year ago, in December 2021, we were at 33% from Google perspective. So it's actually interesting to see that there has been some growth, even though we know that the large service providers that are remaining, Virgin Media, TalkTalk, Talk, are not really deploying IPv6. So just bear that in mind, because when we will be uh, uh, presenting the awards, it's a lot of smaller players in the market, newcomers to the market, who are actually pushing with IPv6 deployment, and that is increasing the adoption in this country. Um, Globally, uh, there was a very exciting moment in April this year because finally the line has crossed 40%. So everybody's like, yeah, finally we are getting there. But you can see on the chart behind me that basically um, our uh, country adoption is kind of in line, little bit, getting a little bit ahead of the global average, what Google sees. And uh, you can see there is the, the typical oscillation uh, on the chart and there's the difference between weekend and the week because people at work, unfortunately, often don't have IP v6 in their enterprises where they work so that that's what creates the oscillation in the line you can see the uh, it's a little bit flat uh, but it's also important to remember that about a year ago the global adoption was at 37 percent so there is a growth solar growth however from what we hear in different conversations with people from different parts of the world this growth is probably going to be accelerating because the pressure on IPv4 um, unavailability is, is real and it's, uh, it's happening. So when we talk about v6, we still have to also mention IPv4. And we were trying to get an IPv4 broker to come and join us at this meeting and give a talk. 
because we believe it's the people who are doing the business. They should be actually telling us how it works. Unfortunately, uh, they were not available today. But uh, some of you might remember, I think I did this, um, um, uh, I displayed, I think, in 2020 or in 2019, when I show you historically how the IPv4 market is developing in terms of uh, price for the transfers. Okay, So we also talked about the issue with the reputation of IP addresses. So somebody is selling a blog but they might be from a country which is blacklisted or there's a lot of spam or some bad traffic coming out of there which impacts the reputation of the IPv4 addresses. So when you are buying the IPv4 blocks, uh, you really need to spend lots of administrative time cleaning up those blocks. So the price is very often determined by the uh, by the reputation, you know, how readily available it is, you know, the transfer policy within RIR, etc. So this was for uh, 2020, and then um, the pandemic was going on, right? And lots of transfers of things kind of paused, and I think everybody has felt it, that people, there was lots of uncertainty. But uh, things started to move forward again this year, and right now, if you really want to stress your CFO or your accountants, I recommend just pushing only to their desktops, not the network engineers, the ticker that IPv4.global has. And you will see how much they will actually more, be more open to your conversation about deploying IPv6 if you have to start buying IPv4. Because uh, the price has changed dramatically. We are now talking for larger blocks of price about $50 per IP address. The information that I'm sharing here is from Hilco Streambank. Uh, you can see the website IPv4.global and uh, you will see this is information about the public transfers. They acknowledge that there is not much information about what's happening uh, privately between the companies if these uh, transfers happen. However, um, I would really recommend to everybody, if you are still struggling with your business case and you know that you need to deploy uh, IPv6 at some point, uh, I recommend you reading a couple of these two articles which were published um, by the guys from Hexabuild. I think Everybody knows these people. They have got IPv6 bus podcast. Very interesting one to listen to, uh, even though sometimes a little bit controversial, but why not? You can listen to that. They've got good articles. The true cost of IPv4 talks about how you really calculate the value of the IPv4 public addresses. But then there is an interesting thought about that your private addresses that your network team, your uh, you know uh, DDI team is giving to your business units actually has also some value. So what if we started to charge inter-department, inter-business units for usage of V4 addresses pr private if they are still refusing to deploy IPv6. And also there was a very interesting panel at Nanoc 85, so these presentations of course will be shared. I'll be sitting in the background just uploading them to the website, so you can go on the links, you can listen to the talks, you can, listen, you can read the articles. Uh, something else? didn't put it on the slide, so it's not there. For people who are new uh, to our event, who are new to the IPv6 Council, I would like to remind you, we post everything, all the videos, all the, um, all the presentations on our website, which is very simple, www.ipv6.org uk. If you want to be kept up to date with what's happening, we've got a LinkedIn group. So if you join that link LinkedIn group, you will see all the updates. And also, one thing that we have not emphasized before enough is that we have a YouTube channel. That's where all the presentations live. And we actually can see how, how attractive these presentations are for people uh, that visit the YouTube channel. And I was thinking, oh, you know, the Sky ISP update is doing really well, you know, almost 500 views. And then I looked, and uh, Terry, he did a talk about NAT64, DNS64. Terry, where are you? You're a star. You've got 1,100 views. And I thought, oh, it's a really, really good one. And then I looked further down in, uh, you know, in the videos, and David Holder with his IPv6 security is holding a record of almost 3,000 views. So you can tell which topics are really interesting, you know, which topics really concern people. IPv6 security, how to deploy NAT64 and S64. So we are actually getting some signals of what we need to bring to you as a, as a content where people are looking for the information. So make sure you check out our uh, YouTube channel as well. When it comes to the future activities, just to conclude this uh, opening talk, uh, we are preparing 
enterprise and IPv6 workshop. And the reason is you have seen the oscillation on the line, and globally, if you talk to anyone, Jean-Charles is going to talk about this too, enterprises are lacking when it comes to IPv6 deployment, massively. And uh, there are reasons, sometimes they are valid, sometimes it's just basically dragging their feet and they think they can hi hide forever behind 944. But you will also hear, um, possibly in the afternoon, that people are looking at deploying v6 uh, in cloud because they are in a way forced to. But then internally on the corpnet, everybody is sitting on for uh, IPv4. So we want to help uh, these uh, these companies. So we are or we will organize a workshop, which will be really focused on the technology, how to deploy the use cases, the different ways, uh, how to go to IPv6 deployment. Then typically we also have at least one roundtable, which is a small format discussion for about 20 people. So that's hopefully going to happen before summer, and. Um, yeah, we have decided it's time to start uh, publishing information or, or create some source of information where people can go and see which ISPs in the UK support IPv6. So when you go and order a broadband connection uh, from BT, Sky, uh, U, uh, Ufiber, you know, BRSK, all these guys, you actually will know that you are going to get IPv6 with that too. Okay, one more gentle reminder. And I would like to invite Tim on the stage to talk about uh, UK universities and their IPv6 adoption.